And of course, you are still watching the 7 o'clock news here on Smart24 TV. Yes, and of course, it is me, Ronald Tushkamoya. Now, before we went in for our break, I had told you that uh, the government did plan on setting up a tribunal to handle cases of forceful land acquisition. And of course, recently, it is pushing a move to see that the owners of this land are compensated after the land has already been taken off, of, of course, for, for, for public projects. Now, to put this in context, we have a, a team from uh, LandNet, yes, and uh, this team is composed of a gentleman, Jonathan Ochom, plus uh, his counterpart, Rebecca Atayo. Welcome to the show. Thank you very Thank you much. Sure. Thank you for having us. A uh, very good evening to you. Now, to start with, first, briefly tell us about LandNet. Um, LandNet Uganda is a non-government uh, organization. Uh, we are a network of, that is engaged in research and policy advocacy on issues of um, land, environment, and uh, agriculture. We exist in over 13 uh, districts in the country, but we also do uh, work at the national level. And uh, our work at the national level Part of it is um, policy advocacy, which, in, uh, which involves um, convening uh, high-level meetings between uh, stakeholders in the land sector to discuss pertinent issues that are key uh, within the sector. Um, for example, tomorrow we'll be having the National Dialogue on Compulsory Land Acquisition. So that, that fits into our mandate of policy advocacy, because this, what's going to be discussed tomorrow, will inform uh, the draft law that government is coming up with. Wow, well, so very briefly, yeah, about land uh, very interesting. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Now, it is no secret that when this uh, was first heard of, the, the president himself did move around in various districts, on um, various media channels, specifically to to campaign for 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 acceptance of the public uh, in line with this forceful acquisition of land. Uh, what, what is your what is your opinion about this? Uh, maybe to start, uh, Ronald, uh, a, a slight correction. Mm. Maybe forceful may not be the most um, appropriate, appropriate word, word yeah. because uh, under the law, it's compiled under land acquisition. The meaning could be the same, but... Uh, well, uh, well, yes, you're right. Yeah, but I think contextually, yeah, the, the correct phrase could be compiled under land acquisition because that's what the law provides right. for. Now, word over um, the power of the state to acquire land for public use is an acceptable practice. Um, Uganda is among you know, the many countries uh, in the world where that power is provided for under the law. As a matter of fact, Article 26 of our constitution, which is the primary law that provides for the right to property, gives an property for public use. So public use and in the interest of defense, health, morality. Right. So, the discussion around compulsory land acquisition is, 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 is a legal one. I want us to just start from that. Background. Yes. It's legal, but uh, uh, founded in the law. Right. Um, in terms of um, <coughs> yeah, yeah, my, my take on, on that, I, 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 I'll say that this is not something that is new. Right. Uh, it has been in, uh, we have our, our, the primary law that regulates compulsory land acquisition in Uganda is the Land Acquisition Act, which was uh, enacted. How do we bring a 1965 law in conformity to the 1995 constitution? Because now the constitution in the hierarchy of laws is a supreme, is supreme compared to other subsidiary laws. Right. So it's now the discussion now should be how do we harmonize the constitution? How, how do we harmonize the existing land acquisition act and bring it in conformity to the constitution of Uganda? And that's what the government of Uganda is now doing. And, uh, and, uh, and some of the compulsory laws are going on in the country. Part of which is the meeting that we're having tomorrow just to discuss what the positions that they are pushing for are now. And we examine how to what extent they, 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 they tally with the position of the country. Right. Jonathan, I like your, 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 your clarity on the word forceful vis-a-vis -vis compulsory. However, I go with the majority. <laughs> and the motu I want to see out there calls yeah. it forceful. Yeah. And... and, and Despite the president's campaigns, it seems this hasn't yet been uh, accepted again by the public. Mm. 
right from the parliament, the parliament has not made much move uh, towards this, this, this amendment. Mm. Why do you think the public has not accepted it and it is still referring to it as forceful? As forceful. Yes. yes. Um, to start with, parliament rejecting the bill, as, 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 you, as, you, as you suggest, arose from the fact that government tried to amend the constitution to sort of uh, to suggest that if government wants to take over your land for public use and then you dispute the amount that has, that been, has been awarded to you by the government the proposal by then was that government will then take over your land then put that amount in court, in court. the idea being that if you change your mind you can go to court and pick that money right if you want to continue to pursue government you can go to you can Continue with your case, but as government, they will be using your property. Right. Now, that's what brought the uproar. And uh, fortunately for us, when the Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee sat and collected views from the different uh, stakeholders, right. it recommended that government actually withdraws this bill. And indeed, on that very day, when the committee was due to present its report, uh, the Deputy Attorney General actually withdrew, uh, withdrew the bill. So, but. You know that issues are really emotive. Indeed. Now you're, you're touching on the you know the soul of the country. Indeed. So anybody that interferes with your right to own property, especially land, you know it's an affront on your livelihood. So that's why people calling it forceful or, or having negative perception about it is understandable because nobody wants to lose their property under circumstances that are not clear on how they are going to be compensated for it. Very interesting. Uh, Rebecca, I may want to pose this question directly to you. Uh, I want to assume you're here to share with you too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, I like your analysis. Quick question though. Who evaluates the land before, uh, to, to, know, to, to know how much is supposed to be given to the landowner? And, and I'm saying this because it is actually a public fear out there that what if the government gets this bill passed mm -hmm. and out of the blue we start seeing people people's land being taken who gets to to judge how much what the land is well um, currently in the land acquisition act it's the chief government value or his agent an appointed agent who may value the land and decide what value or monetary value to attach to a particular piece of land that is going to be taken compulsorily acquired but then um, the owner of the land or project affected person as, as they are known also has the right to dispute if they are not happy with the compensation values that have been assigned to their property. Uh, first of all, they made um, their first recourse is uh, the tribunals that are no longer in place. Right. So they can go to court and, and pursue this matter. And court also gives them the option then of getting a private valuer to assess and see how much does how much do you think your land actually values according to this private value? And I think court then makes a comparison basing on both the government chief value and the private value to come to a consensus. Very interesting, Rebecca. Now, again, I have nothing against the government, but I will need to ask the same questions that our viewer out there would pose to ask you. Why do we have to wait for, for the courts to come into play? What if, what if the government value is biased, mm. you know? Mm. What if we could have an independent player coming right from the start? Mm. Why, does, why does government want this to first go back to court? Uh, that's now in case of uh, valuation. But before that, you did mention that if, if it is not agreed by the party being paid that the land should be taken by government, the amount of money being offered will eventually be pushed to court and this spells out a lot of a lot of um, of traps for the for the for the for the citizen for the individual. Yeah, yeah. No, no. That that was the earlier proposal which was made, but was withdrawn. Okay. That, so that's no longer valid. So why do you think they are retabling the, the proposal right now? No, no, no. What has changed? No. What, what has changed now? If you had what the minister as, as you know said at, me, at the Uganda Media Center today, was that in the new in the draft law that they are making, they are proposing to create. Land, a land acquisition tribunal. Right. Mark my word, a land acquisition tribunal. Right. And that means it strictly handles issues, cases, arise cases out. arising out of land acquisition by government. Right. So meaning if you have a dispute with your family over a piece of land, you do not go to the land acquisition tribunal because that's not a land acquisition issue. That's a normal land dispute that goes to the uh, 
magistrate court, high court. Right. But this tribunal that they are now suggesting is, um, you know, will strictly be looking at issues around that that arise out of uh, land acquisition, uh, out of land acquisition like, by, by the government. So. Right. The proposal has now changed. It's no longer the, the one of the person the money. Very interesting. But, but maybe yes, only yes, just to supplement and say the government chief, but the chief government valuer has a mandate as an office under the Ministry of Lands to value properties on behalf of the state in the event that um, the state is acquiring property, amongst other other duties that they may have. Right. So. For the reason be for that the very same reason that uh, citizens might be suspicious of uh, what can I say bias by the um, government mistrust, by the way, yeah. yes, there's yes. mistrust and there's all this um, contention as to whether those values are are free and, and accurate. That's why they give you the leeway to approach court. Okay. Approach court and, and, and state your grievances as to why you don't think these values amount. Although also we should mention that there are valuation guidelines that were put in place I think in 20, 2017 and it has so many parameters under which they, they decide to compensate you. They compensate you first, first and foremost for the value of the property on which, you're, on which the land is, is um, situated on the, on, on the land itself. Then right. any permanent property that may be there, there's um, an inconvenience uh, allowance. Uh, crops. So there are so many parameters that they use to gauge eventually how much does this property cost and, and that it's more scientific than um, guesswork. It's not, it just doesn't dream up. Uh, you don't wake up and say my land is worth 500 million. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. But again, it is uh, that this has been happening, especially when it comes to uh, major government projects like the Entele Express Highway, uh, the developments in Bunyoro, Karuma and the Siba Dam projects. It is said that owners of those lands have highly inflated their pieces of land and in the process it's also stalling work. Yeah. What do you think needs to be done to solve such an issue? The, 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 the issue around um, inflated prices really speaks to probably the weaknesses within the, um, the valuation framework uh, right. in, in the country. And, and one of the things that really, really we'll be looking to um, tomorrow when the government presents a draft bill is to see how it's trying to fix the, 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 the whole issue of valuation so that we are at figures that are mutually acceptable to, 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 to all uh, you know, you know, parties in this transaction. You will note right. that the reason some people really hike their prices is maybe they have inside the information. Right. You know, this is a fact that yeah, you know, some people maybe you know generally think this is government, government is a good person to do business with. I can instead of selling it at fifty million, I can sell it at hundred million. So there are, there's a bit of a trust issue that, that probably that needs to be fixed. So we'll be looking tomorrow how the government is proposing to address these issues because if you look at our plan um, dialogue that will happen tomorrow, right. we want to have a discussion around, after government presents the draft bill, we'll be having a discussion around the challenges, uh, the experiences around this area of the question. So we'll be specifically trying to see how is this you know, issue of violation being addressed now in the, in, in, the, in the proposed law. Very interesting. Now, Jonathan and Rebecca, it is no secret that such tribunals have been set up in the past. Mm. Some have achieved, mm. but Despite the achievements, most of these tribunals are marred by accusations of corruption. Mm -hmm. And uh, people have started putting in question these tribunals being set up by the state. Mm -hmm. How genuine are they? How able are they to deliver the required results to the Ugandan public? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 it's interesting. So the last time we had tribunals were, they were the district tribunals right. that were really set up by, by government to enable people access land justice at the, at the lower level without having to go through the, the, the bureaucratic yes, uh, uh, court right. process. Now this tribunal that we're proposing, I mean I personally heard about it you know, today for the first time because the bill is still under key and lock in the ministry, so right. tomorrow they'll be unveiling it to us to, to hear what's in there. Right. Um, yeah, so uh, setting up a land acquisition tribunal may not be the magic bullet, but I think it's a, it's a step in the right direction. Because imagine Ronald, you're having a land, uh, uh, an acquisition issue with, with government, then you're going to file your matter in the, in the usual court, formal court, system. formal court system, 
which has already has um, about eight, sure. ten thousand yeah. land cases yes. in, right. in, in, in the back backlog. It, it really wouldn't help you. So I think having a specialized tribunal, if the timelines that the ministers spoke about today are really there to be talked about, you have fifteen days within uh, after uh, the evaluation is uh, an award has been proposed to you. You have fifteen days to. Uh, to submit your grievance to the tribunal, then you have another 30 days, which which has to make addition in 30 days. After which you have to, you can only appeal. You can appeal, and the appellate court has about 45 days to to to, to handle the matter. Right. So meaning, we're looking at a term like we're about two months. Have a, a line is that realistic? Uh, in your opinion, in your opinion, is it realistic? It, it 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 may not be depending on how the backlog is going to you know to 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 to, mm. to come, but I think it's it's a good proposal to have. Mm -hmm. And um, if we're able to finance these structures well, ensure that they are well resourced and able to deliver on their mandate, mm. it, it, it's possible. Very interesting. You're talking of financing, and I imagine this is all taxpayers' money. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. Now, I'll ask finally the, this question. How is, just so we are clear, how is this different from Justice Catherine Bamugemerile's uh, tribunal? Mm. Well... You, uh, Rebecca? Yes, so I, I think this is different because uh, whereas, first of all, in terms of jurisdiction, mm -hmm. uh, Justice Bamgemere's uh, commission is dealing with land issues generally in right. the country. Yeah. This is a pseudo court. Uh, mm -hmm. What it has powers of a high court, I would imagine, mm -hmm. but it's specialized for land acquisition disputes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's able to focus with a stricter lens on, on issues arising out of land dispute, uh, um, land acquisition processes, right. yes. Very interesting. Now, as we, as we close up this uh, session, if I may call it, brief us about tomorrow's meeting. Okay, so tomorrow, uh, Planet Uganda, well, together with the Minister of uh, Lands, uh, Minister of Energy and Mineral Development, and the Minister of Works and Transport, uh, with support from uh, the German Corporation, is organizing the, will be holding the National Dialogue on Compulsory Land Acquisition. All right. we, we came up with this idea out of the realization that every time government has made proposals to reform the laws around land acquisition, it has been met with a lot of hostility and a lot of, you know, outcry from the, from the public. All right. And our view is that, uh, that probably one of the reasons that outcry has been, has been uh, that rampant is because We've not had spaces from which citizens and governments sit together and listen to both sides of the story. Right. So, so tomorrow we have a broad range of stakeholders within the land sector. We have the Ministry of Land, we have, ministry, we have a whole list of ministries, departments, and agencies that are involved in land acquisition. We have members of parliament, we have uh, civil society organizations, we have the academia, we have faith based organizations, we have uh, project affected persons come together and sit and analyze what government is proposing. Our keynote speaker is going to be Professor Mahmoud Mamdani, who has written extensively yes. on, on, on issues of land in Uganda and, and globally. And, 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 and the, the whole idea is, look at what government is presenting. Then objectively, as outsiders who are not within the state machinery, see whether these proposals are going to address the issues that, mm. are, that are rising out of land acquisition in the country. And, and if that's the case, for us as land, our interest is to have a good law that balances the interests of the state to develop. Because, I mean, the, the, the state has a mandate to pursue a development agenda mm. that pushes the country to the next, you know, um, uh, Vision 24. Vision 24 and all these other economic aspirations. Right. But the argument is, while the state is pushing that development agenda, it should not do so at the expense right. of the citizens. Right. So we want to look for a law that enables the state to perform its as uh, deliver its aspirations, but at the same time respect the rights of landowners. Very so the discussion tomorrow will be really, you know, and us to appraise the current proposals that are in the bill, and give our input. After which we will develop a report that will hand over to government, and our hope is that that report informs. The, the, the deliberation tomorrow will inform what is eventually enter into that draft law which law will let be submitted to cabinet for approval and later on to parliament for, yeah, for passing. Do, do you have a representative in parliament? We have MPs mm -hmm. that, that, that right. have been invited. What's in fact, on a steering right. committee of Honorable Stephen Mwichitale, one of the one of those MPs who has you know, spoken extensively about uh, land issues. 
Um, but we also have these other colleagues from Parliament coming joining us tomorrow. So we'll be picking their minds. We've invited local governments, especially from those districts where government is acquiring land. So for example, you go to Tororo, they're doing the Stanley Railway. You go to Hoima Bulisa, they're doing the oil refinery. You go to places like Luengo, Rakai, where they're going to be passing the East African crude oil uh, pipeline. You go to Karamoja, where there's a lot of mining and stuff like that. So we, 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 we select them, they try to pick on those districts which are the hotspots where land acquisition is going to be, or is already uh, you know, happening, and just seeing what experiences that they can share what challenges they can share, what are the best practices around this issue, and have all this compressed together and put to government and say, okay, now here are the ideas of the people seated uh, today here, put them in the law. And, and, and I think for us, once we achieve that, we look forward to having a good law that enables all stakeholders, that leaves everybody happy. We call it a dialogue because we want everybody to live, we want to create that equal, that balanced you know, space where everybody is free to express their views, so that at the end of the day we have um, yeah, good luck. Very interesting. Rebecca, you want to add some of that? No, no. I think he has exhausted it. Uh, now, without necessarily intending to be negative, yes, please. we seem to be riding on hope here. You know, <laughs> we hope that our document will be accepted. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any checks and balances in place? Because such similar, many such similar e e events are held and mm -hmm. government stakeholders are, are, are normally engaged. Mm -hmm. But then when they get to that house, it seems they don't they do something contrary to what would have been agreed. Mm -hmm. What checks and balances does LandNet have? Um, well, well, maybe we want to start this on the LandNet issue. This is really a national issue. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think everybody who lives in Uganda should be concerned about land because what defines our territory as a country is land. So that has that, been made clear. But in terms of checks and balances, we've had um, a lot of ex, you know, extensive discussions with, um, the with, the, with the Minister of Lands. And, and, and we all agree that it's in the interest of, of, of government and the citizens to, right. to, 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 to have a good law uh, that makes all of us you know, happy. And so we're looking for a win-win situation. We may not have all the assurance that our views will, are going to be considered, right. but I think it's important to make the attempt. Yes. Uh, and uh, let, let history show that on this day we have these discussions and uh, this is what the people of Uganda mm -hmm. think. And if government doesn't adopt it, that's another issue. But but we're optimistic because um, land is a very emotive issue. It's uh, it, it's I think it's something every politician in Uganda is, is careful about. Very interesting. And we want to ensure that their voters tomorrow don't become victims mm -hmm. of land acquisition. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. Now let, let's go into a bit of forecast. Yeah. I know such a move is going to cause a lot of challenges and uh, public outcry. Mm. Away from that, what are the other challenges that you foresee in this move to table this bill again? Well, um, I think for me, because the, the bill is already addressing issues that have been in the public domain, most of the outcry would come from a suspicion, lack of trust mm -hmm. that the citizens have um, towards the government. People don't trust the government. So if um, objective conversations are not had about what is... Uh, contained in this bill and what are the intentions of the government towards uh, land and acquisition of the same, then um, there's definitely going to be outcry about uh, government wanting to forcefully, we'll, we'll say forcefully, uh, take their land because it's not on a willing buyer, willing seller basis. So I think that the suspicion has to be dealt with through continuous sensitization, engagement with the um, um, citizens, uh, people in project affected areas need to be continually engaged until they come to a middle ground and an understanding with uh, the government really on, on acquiring land in a more peaceful uh, manner. Interesting. Jonathan? Um, yeah, challenges will always be part of you know every process. Yeah. I think for me, probably after the law is passed, um, the biggest challenge as well as been implementation. So you have, for, for example, the proposal of um, a tribunal being, yeah, being mooted, which I think it may be an excellent idea. Yeah. The question is, will we, will we resource it so that it's able to I deliver on its mandate? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, are we going to staff the Office of the Chief Government value yeah. adequately so that they have enough people to handle the different, you know, 
the, 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 to, to handle the different transactions that will be government will be handling. Because I think, as we speak now, it's one of the most probably um, and understaffed you know, yes. offices in the, in the ministry. In the ministry. Yeah. So there, there are, so there are all, all these issues around implementation. So, but I mean, the, the, I think the good starting point is first to have that good law. And then we yeah, will deal with that also when we reach that. Yeah, Interesting. Right. Still, much as we we'll cross that bridge when we get there, allow me peep at the bridge still. Okay. How do you think, apart from staffing the right offices in the right way, how else do you think the government will need to address Better yet, what do you think the government will need to do to address uh, some of those challenges that you've 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 foreseen? Yeah, the challenge. I mean, it 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 has to be you know deliberate action. So if you if 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 you're going to undertake project X, for example, one of the things we always argue is that if you're going to do a road. A road is not something you just wake up to do. You have to plan. So before right. you get money from a donor or from a, a banker. Before you get a loan, you mm -hmm. need to do your planning. I think one of the biggest challenges we have in this country is that you know our, our planning, yeah, development comes, precedes development planning. Precedes planning. Yeah. So, right. you, so you get to a point where nobody now is thinking ten years down the road how much land has government need to do project X Y Z. Right. So you see, you we do things in a haphazard manner. So you wake up tomorrow, oh, so you have this small loan from the World Bank. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. But then suddenly you have um, uh, you have uh, a project which is time bound. But then you spend half of the project life mm. handling land issues. So right. I think as government, one of the things that they need to do is to improve on our planning processes to ensure that we're able to forecast what are our, what are the needs uh, government are going to have in the next five or ten years. And and as we as we fundraise for the different projects, ensure that we saw the preliminaries. If you're going to uh, to fundraise for a road, I think it would be it's prudent to start with acquiring the land for the road, mm. so that by the time the money comes. Yeah, your work is smoother. Otherwise, we're going to get, you know, if, if, if the planning function is not, you know, well, you know, streamlined, yeah, we're going to be dealing with these issues back and because then you're going to need land quickly uh, to, you know, to fulfill your timelines in the project. Mm -hmm. And because you don't have all the time that you need, then you start, you know, looking for shortcuts here and there. And this right. puts us back into the problems we're grappling with right now. Very interesting. Well, well, for me, I would think that uh, even when planning, because I think the government is trying as much as it can to plan ahead. For example, I don't know under what um, regime the whole plan, the, the whole country was declared a planning area. Yeah, and physical planning. Yes, the, the physical planning act and there's a, a plan to have a master plan for the whole country. But that information does not trickle down to the, to the common man. So people are not armed with information and they are, they are acting with, uh, what can I call them? You're not acting on, on true information. Mm, You're, yes, they're basically dealing with uh, speculation, what is uh, portrayed in the media, the biases of, say, uh, politicians, or so the information is not eventually passed down to the people who would be affected by these projects. Very interesting. And now, as we close, I will ask a very vague, ambiguous question. Mm. Uh, do you think this is a good move? Retabling this bill, do you think it's good for government to come and uh, compel? Uh, well, mm. let me avoid the word forceful. Mm. To, to to take land as it may, regardless of uh, the motives. No, um, I, I, maybe retabling is not the the, the 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 most accurate word to use because um, what we're now doing is that we are Have repealing and replacing mm. the right. acquisition. Uh, maybe something else that I, I could have mentioned at the start right. was that our 1965 law was nullified by the Constitutional Court and the Supreme Court section in 2014. Right. Specifically, Section 7, which said that once land had been declared for, uh, for, for public use and the declaration had been published in the Gazette, then the minister immediately had powers to take over that land. Uh, the court, uh, the Constitutional Court, and the, which was confirmed the Supreme Court, you know, ruled that uh, that provision was unconstitutional. So. Essentially, that nullified a critical section of the of the law which government was using for acquiring land. So what's happening now is that government is repealing that law completely and creating a new one. So maybe it's not. Jonathan, you're too technical. Yes. I, I like that, yeah. but please answer my vague question. So the issue remains. <laughs> land acquisition, I, like I said, is a global practice. It's yes. here to say it's one of the tools that governments use for pursuing their development yeah. agenda. And like, I, like we should always argue, development is not for the government. 
ultimately should benefit as mm. the citizen. That's why the law states that a compulsory acquisition of land should be done under the law that provides for adequate compensation, and that compensation has to be done prior to the taking over of the land. So, in your opinion, yes. it's a good thing, right? Well, I, I think we also have to look at the fact that in Uganda, land is owned by the citizens. Mm -hmm. So, uh, apart from a few isolated uh, pieces of land here and there, government does not really own a lot of land. Mm -hmm. So, also subjecting the government, uh, the best resort, first of all, would be buy the land mm -hmm. on a willing buyer-seller basis. Right. Government cannot afford it if we were to look at it from a, an objective point of view. That is why, as a, a last resort, that should be the ideal situation. As a last, last resort, government has to compulsorily acquire this land. But under what parameters? Mm. Those are the parameters that we have to focus on. Mm. Because regardless of whether we want it or not, this has to happen. And it's now constitution. It's yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's very clear in Article 26 to uh, uh, the, the power of the state to acquire land compulsorily for specific under specific conditions. So what we should look out tomorrow is are those specific conditions set out in the constitution embedded in the current law. Yeah. So to answer you, you know, uh, straight up, this is progress in the right direction. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I like that analysis, of course. Do share with us, uh, is there any other detail we need to know about tomorrow's gathering? Yeah. Are the invitations still open? <laughs> Can anyone come and be part of it? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. I think for, for, to, for tomorrow, we have... Um, you know, a, a select you know pool of stakeholders that right. we've, uh, that we've invited, uh, but we we should be will be live um, on social media for those who are active online. So our hashtag is Land Dialogue UG. Right. So if you go to Land Uganda Facebook page and the Twitter handle, we'll be streaming this event live. So for people who are just a click away, you can sit down and follow like live updates on what's happening at at, at Naguru Skies Hotel. Um, but we hope that. Um, in future, we'll roll out these consultations, you know, across the countries. Already, the Minister of Land, uh, is with, uh, with, in partnership with um, a number of land actors, have held consultations in Hoima, they've held another one in Karamoja, and I know that this is not the end of it. This is really, yeah, one of the, you know, the initial steps. We hope to be able to roll out, you know, a massive countrywide consultation program that, that, that will pick, you know, voices from across the country. Very interesting. Now, as we go off, final views, final views. Let's start with the ladies. Uh, well, um... I think Jonathan has, has summarized it very perfectly. For me, it would be to call upon all stakeholders to take an interest in the issue because it's an issue that touches. You never know. It should, it should probably each and every one of us uh, in one way or the other. So engage your area member of parliament, give your opinion on the issue, uh, push for what you think is the right thing to do and engage them to push for that as well. Interesting. Final views? Yeah, for me, really, from, from a legal perspective, compulsory land acquisition is lawful, it's provided for under, under the law. The issue is how it's done. Does the implementation conform to the requirements of the law? Mm. So, as a principle, compulsory land acquisition is lawful. The challenge has always been how is it implemented. So, these are things we should look out for in our discussions tomorrow and subsequently to explore how the bill that government is, is drafting now um, conforms the, 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 the conditions set up in the constitution. All right. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Are you a lawyer? Yes, I am. Ah, no wonder. <laughs> now I get it. <laughs> I knew to get that because you're too technical, which I like, which I like. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jonathan Ochom uh, from LandNet. Now, LandNet is not land. It is land attacker. L-A-N-D <laughs> net. Is that so? Yes. And of course, Rebecca Atayo. Yes. Right? Yes. Thank you so much. And of course, our dear viewer, this conversation is still going on, like you, uh, like you, you did hear from uh, Jonathan. The hashtag on Twitter is Land Dialogue. UG. UG. Land Dialogue UG. Share your views and, of course, do tag in Smart24 TV. Yeah. Otherwise, that's it for now. We're going to be back at exactly 8 with the East African News. Stay tuned.